Uh, hey, what's up everybody? It's Rutech. Today I'll be telling you about the best $600 ITX gaming PC that you can build in June of 2021. So in this video, I'm giving my own parts selections for a specific price range, but perhaps you have a different smaller or bigger budget, or you're looking for something with different specific features and want a more personalized recommendation from a highly trustworthy source. Well, there's this new and upcoming free shopping tool called Luster. It's a free Chrome extension that gives you exactly that. Not only does it find and analyze trusted expert reviews, but it also brings up discussion forums mentioning products like on Reddit or video reviews on YouTube. Let me give you guys a little demo. So I'm looking for the best CPU for around $500. So it gives me the top five CPUs for that exact price range. And it backs up exactly why they're the top five with tons of info and data. Let's take a look at what they tell me about the i9-10900K. It compares a bunch of 1 to 10 scores from multiple trustworthy websites, such as PC Mag, PC Gamer, Windows Central, Tom's Hardware, etc. And then right below that, it shows me all the tech specs, which I really like. The point is, you're going to be saving a lot of time and money using Luster. Link to get Luster is in my description. Let's get started. Starting with the CPU and GPU, the Ryzen 3200G. For $600, if you want to buy all new parts, this is definitely the best you can get. For the motherboard, I chose the B450i Gaming Plus Max Wi-Fi Mini ITX board. It's very small, but it won't let you down. In the box, we also find a bunch of other things, SATA cables, IO shield, Wi-Fi antennas, directions, etc. Those items will come in handy later. First, let's get the motherboard out of its packaging. Yeah, like I said, it's very small. So before we start installing things onto the motherboard, we need to place it on top of the box. This is just one of those precautions to prevent ESD damage. The first part we're going to be installing onto the motherboard is the CPU. Before we install the CPU though, we have to lift the socket lever. Then grab the 3200G, locate the golden triangle on the bottom left of it, and match it up with the circle on the corner of the socket. Then slowly and gently install the CPU. Once you can confirm it's in all the way, you can lock it in place by lowering the lever. This is one of the most satisfying parts of PC building in my personal opinion. Even though I know for some of you, it's probably the scariest. But be sure to take it slow with the CPU and you will not mess up. Anyway, next up is the NVMe SSD. We'll be installing this actually on the back of the motherboard, which does make sense since it's so small. The two parts you'll need for this step are the M2 screw, which you can find in the motherboard box, and the crucial P2 500GB NVMe SSD. The SSD easily slides right into its socket and will be fastened into place using that M2 screw. Next, the RAM. To prepare the motherboard for the RAM installation, you have to open up these two RAM retention tabs. And the RAM I chose for this build is the Team T-Force Vulcan Z DDR4 2x8GB sticks of 3000MHz CL16 RAM. Make sure you put the RAM in the right way. The sticker on the RAM should be facing the CPU. And all you really need to do is apply some even pressure on both sides of the RAM sticks and they'll click into place. And now, so far, we have the RAM, CPU, and storage installed. Now it's time for the cooler. First step is to remove these two pieces that are sitting right next to the CPU. Not a very hard task, they're just held down by two Phillips head screws. We also have to remove the MOSFET's heatsink. Remove these two screws that'll be found on the bottom of the motherboard, and then remove the heatsink itself. This heatsink isn't exactly necessary for this build since it isn't very power consuming, but you could totally replace it with some tiny heatsinks, as you can see here on the corner of your screen. And the link to them will be in the description like all the other parts. Anyway, now for the CPU cooler, place it onto the CPU, align all the screws with the screw holes on the back plate, and fasten the CPU cooler screws in an X pattern. And finally, plug the CPU cooler connector into the header labeled CPU fan. And now all of our main components are installed onto the motherboard. Now let's take a look at our ITX case, the Cooler Master NR200 White. Before we can install anything into this case, we have to remove the side panel and this fan bracket, and then you'll have to unwind these massive twisty ties to remove this box inside. In addition to this, you'll also have to remove the top panel. By the way, side note, both side panels and the top panel, they don't have any screws that secure them in place, they simply click out and pop back in. 
Next part that I wanna focus on is the power supply, the EVGA Supernova 550GM SFX form factor power supply. And you take the power supply out of the box and you start to realize how small it really is. And that's because it's designed for super small builds just like this one. And here's how big the power supply is compared to my, I'd say, average sized hand. So yeah, pretty cool stuff. This supply is fully modular. We're going to be using the SATA cable, the motherboard power cable, and the CPU power cable. Let's start with the SATA cable. This plugs into the area labeled, you guessed it, SATA. CPU plugs into, yep, CPU. And the split side of the motherboard cable plugs into the area labeled MB. And those are all the cables we'll need coming out of this power supply. Now let's put it into the case. And to do that, you first have to remove these two screws so that you can get a hold of the power supply bracket. Make sure that the power supply fan is facing in this direction. And then you can fasten in the power supply using the four included screws that should be in the power supply box. Then you can take that full assembly of the power supply and the power supply bracket and place it right back where it came from. Don't forget about the two screws at the bottom. Then take the power supply power extension cable and plug it into the power supply. This should already be in the case. And now for the IO shield, I've put in like dozens of IO shields. It seriously never gets easier to put them in. It probably took me a good two minutes to put this whole thing in, but you apply even pressure along the sides until it snaps into place. And now we can finally put the motherboard in the case. The best way to do this is to align the IO with the IO shield. And then using these four screws that come included with the case, we can fasten the motherboard into place. Next, we have the power cables, starting with this 24 pin power connector. This plugs into the largest header on the motherboard on the very right middle section. Next up, is the CPU power connector. You can find the header for this on the very upper left corner of the motherboard. It's actually a little difficult to get it plugged in since it's in such a tight space, but you know, be a little clever with it, you know, uh, hold it by the corner or something and it'll go in. Now for the front panel connectors, starting with the USB 3.0 cable, this plugs into the header on the very top right corner of the motherboard. And just like all the last connectors we dealt with, this only goes in one way. Next, the HD audio connector. This plugs into the header that's labeled JAUD1. It's actually labeled a little weird on the motherboard, so here's a diagram on the screen for you guys. And last but not least, we have the front panel connector. Cooler Master made it real easy. You don't have to plug them all in individually. This plugs in directly above the audio connector. Now for the fans. Now we're not actually going to be using the fans that come included with this case. We're instead going to be stealing these long screws that come pre-installed on them. Loosen up these silver Phillips head screws on all four corners. And then once you can remove this grill, you can use your fingers to fully remove these long screws from everything else. And be sure to do this with both of the included fans. You should have eight of these long screws. And the fans that I chose out for this PC are the GIM KB28 RGB three pack of 120 millimeter white fans. Now, interestingly, you don't have to screw these in. These long quote unquote screws, I guess they're not even screws, uh, just snap into place. And yeah, as you can see, they hold on pretty well. They're not going anywhere. But yeah, snap them in on all four corners of both fans. And that's pretty much it for the two top exhaust fans. And ensure that you route the fan wires through the dedicated cutouts. Otherwise, the top panel will not click back in properly. And since these fans are controlled by remote, we're going to need to install the fan hub. The best spot, in my personal opinion, is right here in the front where it's out of sight. At least when you're looking at the computer from the front, which you will be doing most of the time. And this hub is powered by the SATA cable. Plug it into any of the three connectors that are coming out of the power supply, then you can tuck the cables out of sight. And now we can plug in the connectors that are coming out of the top two exhaust fans. It seriously doesn't matter where you plug them in. I just plug them in into one and two because why not? Now for the final fan, our single intake fan. You should really only be installing this if you're not using the glass side panel, otherwise it's completely redundant. But yeah, take that fan bracket that we took off of the case earlier and install the fan on the right middle-ish section of the bracket. Oh, and these screws right here come with the fans. Now before we screw this bracket and fan into place, we need to plug the fan in just to make things a little easier. I plugged it into three, but again, it really doesn't matter which. The bracket has its own little slot you have to slide it into as you can see right there. And then you can fasten it in place using those two screws that we removed earlier. And that wraps up all the stuff we have to do on the inside of the PC. And our final step is to install the Wi-Fi antennas. They should be in a little bag in the motherboard box. They screw right onto the IO, twist and adjust them as you'd like and put the side panel back on and you are finished. Now let's get to installing windows and drivers. So first things first, we have to get Windows onto a USB drive. This drive has to be at least eight gigabytes or more. Plug this drive into any spare PC that you have and then head over to Microsoft's 
create Windows 10 installation media page and click download. And once you have that installation tool pulled up, you'll have to click create installation media, click next, and then make sure your language and addition and architecture are all correct. Then click next. Make sure USB flash drive is selected, click next and then click on that USB flash drive and then click next for one final time. And then be patient, it takes a little bit and then it'll finally be ready. You can click finish and remove your USB drive. Then take that USB drive, plug it into your new PC, boot it up and you should be greeted by this Windows setup screen. Click next, then click install now, click I don't have a product key, select either Windows 10 Home or Pro, then click next, then brush up on your applicable notices and license terms, click I accept, then click next, and then custom install onto your 465 point something gigabyte drive, which is your P2 500 gigabyte SSD. So now you need to activate Windows, so head over to digitalchillmart.com, the best place to get cheap Windows 10 license keys. Scroll on down to Windows 10 Home or Windows 10 Pro, whichever you chose when you were installing Windows. Pay with whatever method you'd like and be sure to use the coupon code RUTEC at checkout to get a good 10% discount. Then go to the search bar of your new PC, type in activation settings, click the first result, then click the button that should say activate or enter product key. Once that is all done, turn off the PC, turn it back on and spam the delete key on your keyboard. This will boot you to the BIOS screen. And once you're there, you're going to want to click this button right here, AXMP, which will allow our RAM to run at a higher clock speed. Then you can X out and click yes. As for drivers, you can find the links to all necessary driver download links in the description below. And now for the benchmarks, as you could probably tell, this PC has no dedicated graphics card. Instead, it utilizes the integrated Vega 8 graphics in the 3200G, which actually runs pretty well. And keep in mind, the 3200G is fully overclockable, so if you're not getting the frame rates you desire, you can absolutely overclock. Just be sure that you replace the heat sinks for the MOSFETs. All right, no more voiceovering for me. Uh, I'll just let some nice, soothing music play in the background while you guys watch these great benchmarks. Peace.
So yeah, that will wrap it up for today's build tutorial video. If you enjoyed the video, drop a like. Have any comments or questions, be sure to drop a comment below. And if you enjoy the content that you're seeing, drop a sub. Also, I have a Patreon now. If you wanna join the community, help support me and also get some cool benefits, you should definitely check it out. Link will be in the description. Thanks for watching, peace out.